for a year to Dr. Yakovo and Onas Cardiothoracic Center. And uh, practically it's important, you know, when uh, uh, the imager is hand in hand with the interventionalist when uh, we are dealing with mitra clip. And for us, uh, the imaging, the echocardiography is important in pre-procedural, -pre intra-procedural and post-procedural. And um, as, you, as we know, the mitral valve is rather, rather complicated. It consists of anterior and posterior leaflet, three scallops for each. And it's, uh, the, even the annulus uh, has a different uh, shape when compared to the tricuspid annulus. It's more saddle shape. And actually, we know that there is the posteromedial papillary muscle and then the anterolateral that actually has uh, ruled a lot of dynamics on the leaflets and uh, with, together with the LV. But practically, when uh, we visualize the mitral valve, we use all our senses. And this is because it's important to precise uh, the location of the involved leaflets and scallops, then describe whether there is any, any calcification and the extent of that. And of course, to, uh, to detect anatomical changes. And also, even for the interventionalist, it's important to identify indentations or if, whether it's cleft, which is very different. And uh, as you will see, we have a classification of mitral regurgitation uh, depending on the Carpentier classification, like type 1 is coming from the dilate annulus, uh, such as atrial fibrillation, which is quite common now in our patients, or uh, previous endocarditis. Type 2 is usually what we see in Barlow's uh, valve, and then, or uh, if it is, there is a papillary rupture. And type 3A is uh, the rheumatic, and type 3B is also when we started in putting the first mitral clips ischemic heart disease. And then uh, starting from the basics, I will just show for those that they are interested in the basic imaging that we follow four different approaches from the TOE. And um, this is actually, we did a course uh, last week at the Brompton under Professor Lusher, and uh, we were teaching how to uh, image better the mitral valve. And here, for example, you see that we start from 0 to 20 degrees, the mid is of a GL4 chamber view, and we see different scallops. And then uh, we go to 60 to 80 degrees, which is the commissural view. And here's the trick is to align, to make sure that you see the whole extent of the papillary muscles holding the, sca the mitral scallops. And uh, then we move to 90 degrees, uh, which is a fundamental view that we usually see the whole extent of the anterior leaflet and then uh, P3. And uh, also, and then uh, it's, uh, we go to approximately 120 degrees, that usually we see P2A2. And um, here it's also a fundamental view because uh, we may, when, we, for example, we have P2 prolapse, uh, we see that quite distinctly. And then, of course, we calculate the, uh, the prolapsing height. This, uh, for those that they're wondering, is a typical Barlow's valve. Uh, that's why you see the excess of tissue on the mitral. But also fundamental is, and all our guiding is actually from this uh, 3D surgical view, as we call it. And we, of course, we call it surgical because it's the first thing that the surgeon will see when they go into the valve. And here you see all the scallops uh, and the excess tissue, of course. And we always put the aortic valve at 12 o'clock. Now, uh, it's important, and this is what we have been discussing next door, it's uh, when we have, for example, functional MR, uh, the direct assessment of the vena contracta area depends on the complexity of the jet. And uh, many times uh, the quantification with the regarstan volume or the PISA can be very difficult, especially if the jet is very eccentric. So it depends. We use uh, semi-quantitative methods, for example, the vena contracta width, as you will see, uh, from we always correlate the 2D with the 3D, and then we do multiplanary construction uh, with the 3D vena contracta. And you see we have a threshold on 2D echo more than 8 and uh, more than 40 millimeters with the 3D vena contracta. Of course, other signs such as the pulmonary venous uh, flow, systolic reversal. And remember that we may have blending when we have elevated left atrial pressure or atrial fibrillation. And uh, then, of course, the continuous wave Doppler, whether it's dense. And um, uh, of course, the, the limitation is whether we have eccentric MR, we may, may, we may have difficulty in getting the complete envelope. And you see that we have clear guidelines on how to quantify a severe mitral regurgitation. Now, I want to go a step further, and uh, like uh, we know the four different fundamental steps for mitral clip deployment, and of course, starting from the transeptal puncture 
up to the Mitra clip deployment. And I will go through quite quickly because imaging is fundamental in all these steps until we reach a successful clip. As you will see here, this is important. We have the uh, green patients that they are uh, anatomically su suitable for uh, edge to edge repair. And you will see that, for example, mitral valvaria is important, more than 10, tenting height, flail gap, flail width. And of course, when we start having especially calcification or a complex mitral valve with multiple jets, or for example, in those patients that they have a deep regarstan cleft, then we may consider that this is a very complex edge to edge repair. So we may consider that this is more suitable for replacement. Then, uh, as you see, we do the pre procedural TOE, and the, uh, in order to have an idea about the jet, and we then are responsible to tell the interventionist, look, this is our impression of the jet, where it's coming, the orientation, and whether it's suitable for a, a clip. And then an important step to start with is the supervision and guidance of the transeptal puncture. As you will see, we go to the posterior superior aspect of the fossa ovalis, and we need to be more, ideally more than four centimeters above the mitral annulus for the generative MR, and now like three to four for functional MR. And they are doing, uh, Francesco Maizano is doing a lot of courses and he has also a course every year, the regular base for transeptal puncture. So it's amazing to see um, how uh, he, he uses simulation to get successful transeptal puncture, which is, of course, the first step towards a successful mitra clip. And as you will see, the 3D uh, TOE actually, uh, for us is important in order to visualize the real anatomical aspect of the uh, interatrial septum. And uh, then we measure the distance and we uh, follow the interventionists as they cross uh, the interatrial septum and in order, of course, to avoid any complications and uh, to make sure that there will be enough distance uh, from the mitral valve. So here is an example of uh, transeptal puncture, and you see we follow not only the septum, uh, and the, the, here the, the secret is we, depending on how you feel more comfortable, uh, we use a lot the X-plane on that side, and we switch between 3D and 2D to make sure that it's safe passing of, uh, of, the, of the guide wire, and of course uh, that there, as I said, no complications. Then we insert the system, so again, we follow through 2D X-plane and then 3D is very important. And here the multi multiplanary construction is fundamental because you will see uh, the, everything is related to the great understanding of anatomy for us. And we make sure, for example, it's placed centrally. And then we, uh, as you will see here, we have a proper al alignment. Uh, we always use the aortic valve as the guide to avoid any complications or coming quite close to the LVOT. And we, we choose first the guiding wire and of course then the whole mitral clip system to be perpendicular to the mitral coaptation line. And then uh, we, depending on the leak, we, we use uh, the clock in order to turn together with the interventionist the mitral clip device that of course my colleagues will discuss later. But you will see that we use a lot the LVOT view and the commissural view. And as I said, it's important without confusing the interventionalist then to switch between 3D and MPR to understand the anatomy. Then uh, here you will see how we optimize uh, the, leaf the leaflets. And uh, then we start after we make sure that the leaflets are opening nicely because you know mistakes can happen. Then we start uh, grasping the first the one leaflet and then the other. And uh, now this is the deployment of the system. And then if there is any adjustment, then nowadays we have the opportunity to open again the disks and then uh, close again, the grasp again. And, uh, and then uh, what we are doing is we have to assess uh, the leak, if there is any residual leak or any complications. And here is, uh, for example, one of the very first cases that we published um, a Jack Case reports about a patient who had three clips and then a plug, meaning that, the, and then uh, this is the final outcome, the initial outcome, and then the final outcome uh, with regard to station. But we have to here to assess the mean gradient. Depending on the age, you don't want to leave the patient with a significant gradient across the valve. Now, as you will see, uh, we have certain guidelines about assessing 
the residual mitral regurgitation after percutaneous repair or replacement. And of course, we use the vena contracta. Here, the multiplanar reconstruction is very important because we have to assess, as you know, a jet around the device. So we need to try to assess the vena contracta if, of course, there is any uh, pulmonary vein signal, if there is reversal. But as uh, Francesco, again, uh, I, it was very striking what he said last week, is that we have hemodynamic data here that are very important, and we can discuss that further, that practically you have the LA pressure, and you see that it's dropping immediately after the mitral clip. This is the first objective measurement that your mitral clip has worked and there is not enough uh, mitral regurgitation as residual. So that was a summary of the most important imaging tips. Uh, and the most important is we act as a heart team. You know, we are imagers, we'll give advice to the interventionists, then we are guided by the interventions inside the cath lab. And it's important to forget that these are complex jets. It's important to use all our senses, oral mod our modalities, NPR, which is important. And you know, there is a rapid evolution of technology. Every, every month, every day, we have a different paper that uh, gives us another information. So it's important to keep up to date. With that, I would like to thank you so much for your attention, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Julia, thank you very much for this very beautiful overview. Uh, indeed, uh, the collaboration between the interventional imager and the interventional cardiologist is uh, very, very important for them to be on the same page and uh, have a very good communication. Uh, in the echocardiographer needs to understand the procedure very well, all the procedural steps, uh, and be able to guide uh, all, pro all procedural steps. Um, do you see any role for uh, ICE in mitral valve interventions, in general speaking? So they started actually mentioning a lot of uh, the ICE. Practically, it's in these cases that it's because it's very expensive. Uh, we personally, we do not use it in London because uh, there is no justification of the extreme cost in order to say we, we, we need to use eyes. And it's uh, usually in those patients that you will have a very difficult imaging of the leaflets. I'm not sure if you have used that and uh, you have seen the imaging. Uh, but they, you know, it's a deep, very different the temporal and special resolution when compared to the traditional TOE probe. Um, I saw that in, on many workshops. It seems that it's promising, but I cannot say from my own experience. I think I like the, uh, your mention of uh, multiplanar reconstructions in real time. Uh, it seems to be the way to go in the future for uh, mitral interventions to be able to have um, both the commissural long axis views and the 3D image all in the same plane, uh, in the same image. Uh, and so we're limited sort of with uh, frame rates and uh, spatial resolution. Uh, but uh, it seems that many and more and more people are using it. In, uh, yeah. And there is always optimization of the TOE probes. Like, uh, not only, for example, to use eyes, but we optimize our TI, TI probes more and more to get, you know, high uh, temporal resolution and so on. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more uh, regarding the, your comment about the hemodynamics, especially in residual MR. Um, I think it is essential for evaluation of your result. I think it's much more important than the color. So if you decrease the LA pressure, and sometimes the LA pressure in the beginning is not very high, so it's not a good sensor, but if you go through the pulmonic vein flow, and you see that you have a significant improvement in the pulmonic vein flow, if you get a good systolic uh, uh, flow, I think this is the most important part of the procedure. We recently published it that the most pro uh, strongest predictor for outcomes of the procedure is a systolic vein flow pattern uh, after the procedure, so I personally uh, uh, look much more on the hemodynamics rather than the, the color. Uh, well, thank you very much for your very elegant and informative lecture. Uh, I fully agree with the comments uh, by Dr. Savi. Um, I think we have all overestimated all these uh, echo indices mm -hmm. of quantification of MR. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, we should decide to, to degrade them. They're useless. Yes. Especially yes. during the intervention, there is no reason to try to spend time to measure vena contracta or PISA or anything else apart from the pulmonic veins flow. And uh, another issue which is of paramount importance according to, your, to our experience is that quite often we have a residual MR after the first clip. 
a critical decision is what will be the next step? What will be the position of the next clip? It is something which has not been properly commented in practice. Right? Also, in our experience, we have this problem quite often. And it's a critical decision, Mike, I think. Yes, in, uh, I agree with you. Um, uh, and that's the reason we uh, tend to rely heavily on optimization of our first device. We try to get the best re maximum uh, reduction of MR with our first uh, implant. Uh, so we uh, often will um, reposition and optimize leaflet insertion, which is very critical. I couldn't agree more about the echo parameters. And when we are in an MDT meeting and someone says, you know, when there is a device in and says, uh, what's the PISA? I immediately say it's not, not relevant, you know, because it's, it's, it's uh, already known that it's not valid, the PISA or the Vina contractor, when you have a device in and you want to assess. Look at, the, look at the general picture, look at the patient. I was thinking as you were talking, look at the patient, he's telling you the diagnosis. So as long as there is symptomatic relief of the patient and you achieve a reduction in mitral regurgitation, I think that's all that counts and the LA pressure that dropping. That's your biggest evidence. Yes, I believe that we, have, uh, we suffer from this overload of literature mm -hmm. uh, using this uh, useless uh, data. And especially taking into account that there is a lot of dynamic changes on the mitral apparatus in the performance of the mitral valve, especially on the functional issue. We have faced the scenario of having a, a fully uh, studied person with functional MR and post the anesthesia, there is no MR. Mm -hmm. So you see there is a lot, exactly. of, uh, a lot of functional things. Also in, in organic MR, quite often, we have additional functional component. Right. Perfect. Thank you so much.